Hi, I'm Taylor Lee Harper, and I'm very happy to be here today with Bruin Film Society and Justin Torres, author of We the Animals, which has recently been adapted into a film by Jeremiah Zager. Hi, Justin. Hi, Taylor. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. 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 First and foremost, congratulations on everything. Thanks. Um, both the book and the film are really, really beautiful. Thanks. So, yeah. How does it feel? It feels weird. It feels weird. I mean, we're in this kind of weird room. Weird yeah. things keep happening. I've, I've been doing a lot of interviews, and they always it's always, um, yeah, it's it's surprising, the, the uh, attention that it's gotten, which is great. I, mean, I couldn't ask for more. Yeah. 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 Um, to begin, can you describe the process of how a narrative goes from book to film, maybe beginning with when you were first contacted and by whom? Sure, yeah. So Jeremiah got in touch with me. Um, Jeremiah's the director, and he got in touch with me after reading the book. He just came across it in a bookstore. It was shortly after it came out. And we had oysters. And, like, in, a, in Brooklyn, like, in a... Probably somewhere you shouldn't get oysters from. <laughs> but... And he talked about the book. He, talk, he had read the book. He talked about it with real passion and real understanding. And he kind of got the themes of the book. He got... He got what it was about. And I'd had some contact with Hollywood people, like Hollywood people. Not, nothing like incredibly serious, like nobody was like, here's a million dollars, but you know, like, you know, baby steps towards, towards that. And none of, I mean, it just, nobody seemed particularly intelligent when they talked about the book. They didn't, intelligent about the book itself, right? Like they didn't seem like they got it. And Jeremiah really did. And so I was like, we're going to go with this guy. And my agent was like, no, <laughs> that's crazy. You could get actual money for this. Um, Jeremiah's, I mean, they didn't have any money. It was that this film was made on a very tiny budget. And so, but I just knew that it was going to be good. And, I, and that was more yeah. important to me than anything else. Yeah, because yeah. I can imagine dealing with the subject matter, it so easily being sensationalized or coattailing off of other yeah. films that glorify yeah. yeah 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 I think that's right I think that I think that there's a lot of kind of poverty porn out there there's a lot of lifetime movies about domestic violence there are kind of cliche representations and it you know the, the, the book the material in somebody else's hands could have easily gone that way yeah yeah, yeah. Prior to working on this project, what did you know about Jeremiah, and what were your thoughts on his sensibilities and directing style? I knew not a thing, <laughs> not one thing. Um, after we met, he had made a film called In a Dream, a documentary, so that I went and I watched that immediately, and I thought it was fantastic. It's about his family and his father, who's an artist in Philadelphia. I think both his parents are artists, but the film is really about his father who kind of covered all these buildings in murals, um, like covered these buildings in like mosaic murals, like, you know, little bits of broken pottery and whatnot. And <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all to say, it's a beautiful film. It's yeah. an incredible film. And it's all about a kind of trouble in the family. It's about, it's about artistic sensibility in the family and trouble in the family and pressure on the family. And yet there's still so much love. And, and so I was like, yeah, he's, He's a beautiful filmmaker, and he's got daddy issues. Like, this is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, and I think daddy issues and documentary <laughs> impulses. The film has something yeah. where it doesn't feel constructed. It doesn't feel artificial. It felt like you were watching a very real family. Yeah, so, yeah, I think that that's exactly right. I think he coming from the documentary world, he was able to bring a lot of skills. He did things like he had all of the... He had all of the actors live together as a family. Like, during the shoot, like, mom and pops lived together in a house, and the kids all lived together. And, like, there was one night where the five of them tried to live together as a family, which I don't think went very well. But <laughs> so, like a family. Like a family. <laughs> like this family. Yeah. And so it was, yeah, it was. And I think there's something about that sensibility where he wants to kind of get close to, to real life and kind of real emotions, and he understands what, you know, what kind of, what's powerful about reality. And then also there's this super imaginative kind of 
hyper real, surreal, magically real yeah. element as well. Yeah. yeah, which was a beautiful change from the book because if I'm remembering correctly, the book stays pretty faithful to how the day-to-day goes for the most part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that there is, I, mean, I think Jeremiah picked up on this. I think that there is, there is a, it's not, it's not magical realism at yeah. all, but there is a slight um, magical quality to yeah. the boy's wonder and to what their kind of fascinations and preoccupations are. And then in the language, the language yeah. itself is, it's, it's not a kind of gritty realism that you get in a lot of fiction. It's, it's, you know, it's slightly lyrical. It's kind of moved into the poetic. And so I think that it was kind of answering that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Similarly, Zager wanted you on set. What made you agree to come on and get involved with the production? Were you involved at all in rehearsals or the read-through process? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was. I was there for everything. I mean, he, he, he wanted me to help adapt the screenplay, and I was like, no, <laughs> because if it was terrible, you know, I just put that on somebody yeah, else. Yeah, I don't put my name on that. <laughs> and you and you really sign a sign away when you sell the rights to something. Yeah. You really sign away your right to to change what's going on. But luckily, he was he was kind of persistent that I be involved and charming. And then the first draft I saw of the script was really good. It was really good, and I was like, okay, this is gonna. This is going to be something, um, and now how can I help make it better? And so then I got super involved after reading that draft of the script, like super involved. Like I was, I was there. I was there for casting. I couldn't handle the casting of the kids because they were they looked at like a thousand kids, and like they were all so sweet. Yeah. Like, they were all so adorable. None of them were trained actors. Like they found them. They like went to the Puerto Rican Day Parade. They like they went to these various places, and, mm-hmm. and they just like walk up to kids and be like, "You want to be in a movie?" You know? <laughs> <laughs> and they showed up, and they were so sweet. I saw their audition tapes, and like they were, you know. And it was, and then you just be like, "Next cut, no," you know. Yeah. And I couldn't do it, but the adults, I had no problem with that. I was like, "No, you're wrong." Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. You're old. You've been, you've older. You've been older. You've been through this. You know yeah. what you're going through. But and they were pros. Yeah. yeah. But so I was there in the room for much of the casting for Ma and Pops, and it was fascinating. I mean, it was it was surreal. I mean, these people would like be acting out scenes based on something I'd written, which was based on something that I'd lived, which was my parents fighting. You know, yeah, yeah. in front of me, over and over and over again. They'd be like, oh, "Do it again," and they'd be like so emotional, and they'd stop and like. It was weird. It was w- the dynamics are what was weird. Not so much that I was like, oh, that's me, yeah. you know, and like I feel like my childhood and my experience is being represented. But the dynamic of that family, and they shot it like very close to where I grew up, and like that was very relatable. And we and just seeing these three little boys like running wild. I mean, it was I was I was transported back to my childhood in that way. Yeah, because yeah. I imagine. It's counterintuitive that it's the complications that are what resonate rather than like the simple like this is a mom, this dad, here are the siblings because that's not what my family dynamic looked like, but mm-hmm. just the energy of it and moving from you know a very tender moment into sort of explosive moment and mm-hmm. that it's all one and the same and that it's not black and white. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that I, a lot of people come up to me and they're like, "Oh, this is my story. Like this is this is my story," and it'll be like this like middle aged white lady from Connecticut and like. <laughs> Like, really? She's like this like middle class, like she's you know, just a kind of yeah. like, Oh, she's like got a, the haircut. She's got the haircut, yeah. like mm-hmm. the kind of shell. And it's just but I think that you're right, I think that there's something kind of universal that's like if you ha if especially if you had a kind if you had that kind of family where things moved very quickly from from kind of passionate love to passionate disagreement or even violence, then I think that you it's the dynamics you're right that you relate to, the complications that you relate to. Yeah. yeah. This is uh, pulling back a bit, but were the differences between the novel and the film what you expected? Were the differences what I expected? I mean, I was. it's such a slow process that there, nothing caught me by surprise, you know? Yeah. Like, I was there every step of the way. So every change that was made was discussed with me first. And so the majority of the time, I would agree or get my way. <laughs> uh, but sometimes I disagreed. and and changes were made anyway because 
they had to be for the necessity of the film. But nothing came of a, came as a surprise. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I think it's it's exceeded my expectations in kind of the 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 beauty of it and the subtlety of it and the nuance. I mean, it's really it's not a plot driven film, which I love. It's it's a it's a very kind of image driven film and it's and it's it's, I don't know. There's, there's, it's really poetic, which yeah. which I love, and it's a, and I wanted all of that stuff, and I expected all of that stuff from Jeremiah. But is it? But it did exceed my expectations in that way. The other changes that were made were, you know, I mean, of necessity. Like the the child is much younger mm -hmm. in the book, and he's older in the novel. I mean, in, in the film, and in the novel, he ages. Yeah. to his teenage years in the film. He doesn't, and they, they wanted to stick with one kid because they wanted it to be, you want, they wanted you to be able to relate to one child actor. They thought if you switched actors and brought in an older actor for part two or whatever, it would be too jarring. This before Moonlight came out. <laughs> <laughs> and now we've all learned. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Moonlight, you can only do that once. Yeah. I mean, it's, this it's, is in yeah. its own, and I think that is what surprised me is not only was it not like, okay, this is just this year's Moonlight or whatever, mm -hmm. like, toss away people might have yeah. wanted to label this. I think it has its own tone, it has yeah. its own rhythm. And for me, the most surprising thing is it really resonated with the vignette sort of stuff, like, uh, the flow of the novel, yeah. I think. I have no idea how he translated that onto film, but he did. Yeah. I could, in my mind, having just reread it before seeing it again, I was like, okay, this is that, this is that. Yeah. How, I mean, yeah, I mean, I magical. So yeah. I think like that, if anything, is like a pleasant surprise. Totally. Yeah. And there were so many scenes that were shot that didn't make it in, which is so sad because they were shot and they were beautiful and then they cut them and they were, they're just like these beautiful scenes. And I mean, I think it should be a three hour epic. Yep. I want I'll like, I it. want the three yeah. hour. If like, Peter Jackson can have yes. like 12 hours yes. of Lord of the Rings, then right? I'll take this. Yeah. 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 But no, it's it couldn't be. It's an hour and a half long. Yeah. I'll take it on Blu-ray. <laughs> oh, this would have a beautiful Criterion collection yeah. cover. Oh, oh yes. But how much longer will there be DVDs like in the world? That's a question. As long as I keep buying them, <laughs> I'll buy it on the black market if I have to. <laughs> um, I guess um, then, what were the biggest surprises in the adaptation process, or were there no surprises? There were surprises, sure. I mean, I think being on set was like for the shooting i mean i had never been on a film set ever i don't think it was a typical film set at all but still i'd never been on one and so they shot it over the summer over like five weeks in the summer and it was intense i mean it was like 12 16 hour days i mean it was cramped and hot and and just, I, I mean, I, everything about that was a surprise to me. Everything about that. How many people were involved, you know, like the grips, and like the best boy. Like, I just, I didn't know any of this <laughs> stuff. Like, I don't really know what it means now, but it was, it was just, yeah. So I think that how much passion and how many people were involved was, was kind of lovely and overwhelming. Um, I don't know, what else, what else? I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. I think being involved in it, I imagine, alleviated any unpleasant surprises. I think I just keep thinking of all the horror stories that yes. I've read, you know, when somebody sells the right to their book and then you see the film and you're like, that was garbage. Wait 20 years until maybe somebody picks it up again. Yeah, um, I know. There are yeah. at most, well, I mean, I don't know. The, I was going to say most writers I know whose books have made into film, but it's not like I know that many. <laughs> so, but, but I do know writers whose books have been adapted for the film or for television, and there's, they have a very ambivalent, if not hostile, relationship to the material. They're like, yeah, uh, you know, well, maybe it sold some more books, that's, you know. But they don't really care about the thing. Um, and I really love this. Like, I love this as a work of art. I would love it, I mean, I, it's easy for me to say, but it, it is true that I would love it if it wasn't attached to me, yeah. right? If I just experienced that film in the theater, I would love it. I think it's... It's, so I'm really excited that it exists kind of on its own as, as, yeah. in this kind of really, as, as something really special. Yeah. Yeah.
It really is. I'm not going to get emotional. We're not going to do this. We're cutting this. If I cry, it's gone. Oh my God, um, let's yeah. just cry. Let's, let's just, just cry. That's it cry. for five minutes. Is I mean, genuinely, truly on the verge of tears for the majority of it, mm-hmm. which I think, again, is just understanding the book. None of it yeah. was phoned in. It wasn't made just to be made. It, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. I was surprised because I, I got emotional the f- when I saw... Th- this one, because I saw many scenes kind of as they were cut and then put together. It was one scene that I must have seen. I mean, I saw it Shaw, you know? Like, I saw, I saw, like, early footage. I saw, like, early edits, you know? And then and then one time I, I watched it, and, like, I don't know what they'd done, some small change or something, and I was like, oh, like, I was, like, in the movie, and I got, like, really emotional. And it's amazing that that after being exposed to it so many times and... Having like written the goddamn book, like it's it's still it's like oh, oh, and I think that's something about the transformation there. There was something, maybe that goes to your question about what's unexpected. There was something really tender about, I think Raoul's portrayal of the father that was that like got to me. Yeah, 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 because. Yeah. To read him as a complicated character is one thing. You see that development over the mm-hmm. pages, but to get that then on screen where in a single scene you can see what he's thinking through as the character, as the father. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's interesting. It's been one of one of the kind of pushbacks. I mean, it's been pretty great. The, the reception has been great. And, like, I do all these Q&As. I go to the screenings and I do these Q&As and, and I get a lot of questions afterwards and... Oftentimes, Raul and Sheila, who plays the mother, are there with me, or the kids might be there with me, or whatever. Um, but one of the things that, that people ask about is, like, how they should feel about Pops, about the father. Um, because he is violent, and because also it, it, there's something quite tender there. And people feel uncomfortable with that, you know? Yeah. And, they, and they think, and some people think that it's kind of, um, glorifying a wife beater, and some people don't feel that way at all. But it's it's a question that comes up again and again and again. And I think that there's something in the book when you're reading the book and you're like that you understand that this is a child's perspective and that he idolizes his father as much as he might see that his father is like failing him in certain ways or you know what I mean like being violent or whatever. He still idolizes because that's what kids do, especially kids at this age, right? They just look up to their fathers. And I think that it's harder in the film because there's something about Raul's abilities as an actor and there's something about seeing him and he kind of on his own, right? So you're not, it doesn't feel as filtered through Jonah's perspective and you're now just seeing this man kind of in his own right. And I think people are like, I don't like him, you know? Yeah. Which is interesting. Or I don't know? like that I do like him in yeah. moments. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's right, yeah. yeah. This is uh, of the similar vein, I think. But both the novel and the film are sensitive about what we learn from our parents. We mm-hmm. learn anger, love, uh, forgiveness, and tenderness. Mm-hmm. When it comes to reality and artistic representation, how do you think an artist should navigate the two when depicting something like domestic violence as We the Animals does? Yeah, I mean, that's the question, huh? <laughs> I think you touched on it just granting that it's nuanced. Yeah. And- I mean, it's tricky stuff. I think that, I mean, I I think that what I could do and what I wanted to do was to be honest, you know, and I wanted to be emotionally honest. I mean, it's it's a fictional book, but, you know, like I I grew up in a household with, you know, with with violence in it. And I wanted to be honest about that experience and and what I know of that experience. And and that is the the kind of, the, the, the love doesn't recede just because somebody's behaving in a way that's unacceptable, right? That, that the love either way doesn't recede. And that's not to speak for all cases, right? There's a lot of just horrific cases of sociopaths who are just horrifically abusive, right? But like this family, it's, it's much, it's, it's a lot more about pressure. It's about masculinity. It's about economic pressure. It's about racial pressure. It's about things that are bearing down on this family that are from the outside world. That, that are kind of instrumental in, in what goes on inside the house. And I think that I wanted to write about that. I, want, I wanted to capture all of that. It is, 
I mean, it's it's tricky. I think when you're writing violence in in fiction, the reader can kind of scale it to what they accept. Um, so in the book, the, the father is violent with the kids as well as the mother. And I think that you can read that and you can you can decide how hard that punch was, right? <laughs> because it's it, you're not seeing it. When they shot, they shot a scene where, where Pops hits Manny, the oldest son, and it was just too much. I mean, when you saw a grown man, a big, strong grown man hitting a little boy, you can't, you know, you can't kind of scale it. You can't, you know, it's just, it just is this punch. And, and you couldn't forgive the father after that, after seeing that. Um, so I think it's different in the visual realm than it is in, than it is in, in narrative and prose. Um, I think it's a different responsibility. I think it has a different effect on on the audience. Um, there's different kind of ethical responsibilities. I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I hadn't thought about it that way, but I, I had read into that something where you had shot took that shot out with the children, and yeah. I thought it was of the similar vein in which you know you make Jonah older than he is in the book. Um, that makes a lot of sense. You can't look away from it, and also I think just the pace of a film. You can sit with a book as long as you want. You can take forever. Exactly. You, like each sentence in the novel. When I when I tell my friends about it, I'm like, you know, it's this big, but each sentence is really labored over, mm-hmm. so you can spend an entire day with it. Um, but <laughs> spend an entire day with each sentence. Yes. I love that. <laughs> but I think with a film, it's going. You're moving from. You're moving in a different time, it feels mm. like, whatever movie time is, so... Yeah, well, I think that that's exactly right. The experience of reading fiction, the experience of reading, period, but the experience of reading fiction especially, is that you are in ultimate control of the pace. Yeah. And you speed up and, and you skim when you yeah. want to, like, <laughs> get somewhere quickly, and you slow down and you pause when you need to. And you put it down if you need a break. If it's getting too intense, you put it down and you return to it when when you're ready. And I think that it's an active experience as well, right? You, you're, you're creating this world. You know, reading is so active. And the visual is, is quite passive. I mean, you are you sit down, especially if you're watching in the theater, right? You sit down in the dark, and it happens to you. And if it's getting more and more and more intense, your only option is to kind of get up and out of the theater. Yeah. Even that is like a difficult option, yeah. decision to make, right? But I think that it's just, it happens to you and you absorb it. And then you, then later on you can go and kind of make meaning out of it. But it's, yeah, a completely different experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are moments in every movie that stick out a bit more than others. Is there a specific scene or sequence in the movie that you would consider your favorite? And what about it do you find captures your attention? I really love the animation. I think that that was something that I didn't foresee and it was something that came pretty late in the process and it was like you just because in the book Jonah it's it's his perspective you get all of his interiority you get this kind of roiling you know just like just bubbling over what am I trying to say you get the sense that Jonah is overwhelmed and that he's absorbing much more than he can handle and that it's it's all kind of churning inside of him in the film, it's very he's 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 a pretty passive character. Right? He he watches and absorbs a lot, and so in order to understand what's happening inside of him and how is he processing this or how is he failing to process what's happening around him, you have this journal stuff, and then it kind of spills out onto the film and it spills out, um, it spills out of him, and I love that. And and it was kind of like it was it was it was late. It was like this isn't quite working. What do we? And so. There was this, Jeremiah had this idea to put in the animation, and I love it. I yeah. just love it. And I, I think you really get that he's um, an artistic child, that, that art is kind of one of the ways that we process experience. And I think that, I mean, I drew as a kid all the time. I wanted to be a painter. I'm a failed oh. painter. Before I was a writer, I really oh. wanted to be a painter. Yeah, I'm a terrible painter. <laughs> but I, I, it's my first love and my main passion. Um, and I love that, and, and Jeremiah didn't know that about me. It wasn't something yeah. that we talked about, but I love that, that, that this little kid in this movie is, is processing his world through art, because um, I think that that's, that's the way to do it. Yeah. And I think, too, it is an interesting 
move away from a voiceover, which I could, yeah. I, that's what I think I was anticipating was because it is so much the single eye through this child's perspective. Yeah. I was picturing to get that interiority, you typically have a voiceover, which yeah. is very much movie magic. You you know, there's nobody like <sighs> narrating unless I'm alone in my room, but. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. yeah. There's a little bit of voiceover in the beginning yeah. and then it almost goes away entirely. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I think that, it's it's a brilliant move to, to just have a little bit and then have it go away because I think you need it in the beginning just to kind of understand what's going on. No. But then it's I agree with you. I think I think films some films work with voiceover if they're really intentional yeah. about yeah. the voiceover, you know. Um, but a lot of films it just feels like it would be it would have been more interesting if you figured out a way to to put it in to put it in. And I don't think I've seen animation and art used in this way before. I've seen mm -hmm. it, but used sparingly, but to see it really develop yeah. and become kind of a bigger part of the film as Jonah himself develops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then it becomes literal. You know, it's like, it's, 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 he's drawing and then it's kind of fantastic and you're seeing all these animations and you're like, this isn't, I mean, he's not a child animator, right? Like this, <laughs> you're, you understand this is imagination, but then at the end of the film, it's like it's 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 literally in pieces before you, and it's kind of shattered, and yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like it's a cheap question that nobody can answer, so I won't technically ask it. But I was curious about you know what can film convey that literature can't, what can writing capture that film can't. But I think that whatever the answers between those two, this insertion of the animation bridges uh -huh. whatever those two are. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I think we talked about that a little yeah, bit. I think that there's yeah. a lot that that I love the visual. I mean, yeah. I've really gotten the bug. Like, I'm really, I'm really. I, I always was like, oh, I'd never write a yeah. screenplay. I'd never write a script. Like, I I love fiction too much, and I do. I love fiction so much, but I think that film is so collaborative, and I think that it, it kind of can't happen without collaboration. And, 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 you know, the visual just kind of, it kind of can't happen without collaboration. I mean, besides like really small projects or whatever. But, so there's something about that, that many voices are getting in there. And you, and you feel that, you know, there's something, there's something, um, singular about, about, a narrative experience, right? Like it's a singular vision. Like you enter into a book and you're like, you know, you pick up a novel, you're like, this is, this is this mind. And I'm like, I am having interaction with this particular mind. And when, in the, when you're watching a film, it's, it's so many minds. And that's cool. I like yeah. that. I think I realized I was like a little bit lonely just doing yeah. fiction. But yeah, I guess my last question that I'm now just going to throw out is if anybody who is coming into this film having not read the book before, what do you hope that they take away from the film as its sort of standalone thing? Do you know, all that I want for anybody in reading the book or seeing the film, or preferably both, is to kind of, whatever they've got on their hands, whatever kind of pain they're dealing with, to like consider making art with it. And I think that that's the message of the film. I think that that's the message of the book. I think that that's what you understand watching it is that the main character just has so much on his hands, you know, he's, he's so much betrayal and hurt and pain, and we all do, you know? And I think that one of, I guess my wildest dream is that somebody goes into the theater and is like, maybe I should keep a crazy journal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, maybe I should find some way to kind of funnel the stuff that's kind of churning inside of me out and, and make meaning out of it. Well, before I cry. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for your Thanks time. For thank doing you for your that. answer.